be making your way to Luke chapter 7, Luke the 7th chapter in verse 36. We're going to read that text here in just a moment, Luke chapter 7 and verse 36. This morning I had a little bit of a headache when I woke up, didn't feel so great, uh, but just out of nowhere I received a text from a young lady who's from back home, she's actually uh, down at Florida College right now, and I just point this out to you because I want young people to realize how much of a difference you can make. Just a short little message, just a little bit of encouragement, just really made my day. And it meant so much to me. She had listened to one of the sermons here. I'm not sure why she would spend time doing that when she's heard me a lot, but that meant a lot to me. And just the little kind gestures, a, a small note or a little text message, sometimes can just mean more than you would ever realize. And there's so much that can be done in the kingdom that uh, isn't public, isn't known by everybody, but that can make such a difference. And so I just share that for you. If you feel like I just don't have a lot to offer or there's not things I can do, you, you definitely can. There's so much that can be done by the way of encouragement and uplifting. And I have really appreciated uh, the responses I've had from all of you during these few days that I've been here. Just really good comments, uh, comments about even ways that I, I could have said things a little bit better. And I honestly really appreciate that. Um, you know, all of those things matter, and that's what we're here to do. We're trying to work on getting the truth and journeying together in faith. Uh, and just the, the encouragement that you have all have given me as I've been here has been, been wonderful. If you will, begin reading with me in Luke 7 and verse 36. I want to talk about this sincere woman that comes to Jesus. Luke 7, verse 36, it says, One of the Pharisees asked him, being Jesus, to eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and took his place at the table. And behold, a woman of the city, who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. And standing behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears, and wiped them with the hair of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If the man were a prophet... He would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, Say it, teacher. A certain moneylender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, the one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but he who is forgiven little, loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. This is a story of a woman that society preferred to ignore. She was the epitome of sinfulness. Though her sins are not mentioned directly in the text, it's not hard to imagine that what's being mentioned here is that she is a prostitute or whatever it is, it's at least known to everyone. It's very evident that this one, it is her definition. She is a sinner. Jesus, even in his discussion later in the text with Simon, says her sins are many. It's not hidden at all that she is a sinner and that her sins are many. That is abundantly clear in the text. And what we see from the Pharisees, not just starting in this story, but as we work our way back in the Gospel of Luke, as I might do here in just a moment, is that this is the sort of person, the sort of woman that they had no interest in being around. But of course, Jesus is a little different. Luke's story is fairly incredible. You know the story of Jesus being in the temple at 12 years old, right? asking questions and discussing matters of Torah with the leaders. And then he's healing people. He, he is teaching the people. 
And the rulers are getting very upset. They're getting very agitated about this. The things that Jesus is doing, they're just remarkable. Even back in chapter 5, he heals a leper. And as he, the way he heals this leper is he, he touched him. Now, maybe that doesn't mean a whole lot to us. But in their culture, they'd have well understood, you don't touch a leper. A leper is unclean. It didn't necessarily mean they're morally wrong or evil. It's just this is part of the ceremonial law. They're unclean, and a leper has to do certain things to let everyone know that he is unclean, and you're not supposed to touch him. And yet, Jesus, in chapter 5, he touches, he stretches out his hand, and he touches this man, and he heals him. You probably remember the story of the paralytic that Jesus heals. It's talked about here in the Gospel of Mark. His friends, his amazing friends, they take him and they lower him through the roof. And Jesus looks at him and says, your sins are forgiven you. Some similarity here to the story we just read. And notice the reaction of the scribes and Pharisees. Very typical, as we see at least in the mind of Simon here in our story. The scribes and the Pharisees begin to question chapter 5 and verse 21. Who is this who speaks blasphemies? The next story, he goes to the house of Levi. This is not the first dinner banquet that Jesus went to in chapter 7. No, he goes into the house of Levi, a tax collector. Right? Would have been considered not a whole lot better than this sinful woman, most likely. Verse 30, and the Pharisees and their scribes grumbled. See a little pattern happening here? Everything that Jesus does, the religious leaders, the rulers, they they aren't so keen on the actions of Jesus. They want to grumble at all the things he's doing. Why are you eating here with tax collectors and sinners? And of course, the famous response of Jesus, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And as the stories continue, it's more of the same. In chapter 6, there are these Sabbath encounters, right? They're, they're looking for Jesus, and they're trying to catch him. They, they want him to make mistakes so they can out him. They're, they're envious of him and jealous, and they want to get rid of him. And so they try to attack him on one matter of the law, and that doesn't work. And so on another Sabbath, Jesus actually directly confronts them. There's this man with a withered hand, and he asks them, is it lawful to heal this man? And they're all waiting to see what Jesus is going to do. He knows their thoughts. As the prophet in the beginning of the Gospel of Luke told Mary would happen, he would expose the hearts and the thoughts of many. And we see this happening over and over again in the text all the way up into chapter 7 where he just read, where he knows the thoughts of Simon. He knew their thoughts, verse 8, and he said to the man with the withered hand, come and stand here. And he rose and stood there. And he questions them about the lawfulness of healing this man and giving his life back to him. And then he just heals them right in front of their presence. Now, you would think that Jesus healing a leper and taking a man whose life has been destroyed because he can't use part of his body, and Jesus just says, stretch your hand out, you're healed. You would think everybody around there would just be praising God, would be amazed by the things that Jesus is doing. But verse 11, they were filled with fury and discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. Man, these people are horrible. I want you to see how much they don't love souls. How much they actually hate people. They're in this for themselves. They're envious of Jesus. They don't care about any of these people. They care about their own power and their own glory and their own self-righteousness. Over and over again in the text, we are reminded of this. As story after story, when Jesus is doing amazing things... They disregard that, and even worse, they want to condemn Jesus and sometimes even kill the people that he has healed or he has raised from the dead, like Lazarus. These are the sorts of people that Jesus is working with. And so that brings us then into the house of Simon, the Pharisee. Leading up to this story in chapter 7, he's just healed the servant of the centurion. He's raised the widow's son from the dead in the middle part of chapter 7. And it's hard to know exactly why Simon wants him into his home 
we can maybe make some speculation about that. He wants to figure out what Jesus is really about. Not all the Pharisees are horrible, so I want to point that out for now. We get a lot of uh, portraits of them that aren't so good. But overall, they are a group that actually is very interested in holiness from what we know about them, which is not a whole lot. As a group, they're trying to do their best to uphold the holiness of God when many others were not doing that. And with, uh, the, within the leadership, there is a lot of corruption, and that's what we are introduced to a lot within the stories and the Gospels. But there are Pharisees who are trying to uphold the will of God. And I think one of the reasons we see so many interactions with Jesus and the Pharisees is because they're, they're like this close. You know, the Pharisees, they, a lot of them want to do right, but they just don't quite understand it. They're so caught up in the idea of holiness and separation that they get to a point, at least some of them, where they just disregard people. Did you see that in the text? I mean, they're just, they're upset. Jesus is this example of a, a rule breaker in their mind. This, their rules, not really God's rules. And they're, they're so dead set on the rules that they have made that they've got to get rid of Jesus. He's the problem. And yet, you know what the Sabbath is actually about? The Sabbath is actually about healing and restoration and life. And that's why God has them rest on the Sabbath. It's the very thing that Jesus is doing is he's healing people. And taking care of them on the Sabbath, and yet they look at that in disdain. They don't understand. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And they fail to understand. So Simon wants to bring him in, maybe to question him. Maybe if Jesus is legitimate, Simon imagines that he's going to need his assistance to do the things. I I don't know. We don't know exactly why Simon is bringing him into the house. But we do know is that he doesn't really feel the need for Jesus because that's where this story is going. It, It seems to indicate in the text that he feels like Jesus needs him. He's bringing him into the home. Typically, these sorts of ordeals are about honoring people or at least these these situations. It's like where honor challenges would take place. So one of the reasons that the Pharisees and the scribes hate Jesus so much is a lot of what's happening in these stories that we read about them are, are, are typical, like they're called honor challenges in antiquity. A question is asked and they're trying to stump you and make you look foolish, right? To kind of uphold their power. And Jesus continually humiliates them. And it's an embarrassment to them. And it really in that culture, they, they're so group oriented. It's their whole family. And we are very individualistic, so we think, you know, our sins or our mistakes or our bad choices. I mean, that, that, it says something about me. But in their culture, it's much more kind of a groupthink sort of thing. And so when you mess up, it's an embarrassment for your whole family. And Jesus is repeatedly embarrassing them. They want to get rid of this guy because of this. Simon brings him in. Maybe he's going to figure out some more about what's going on here. And then there's this woman, this nameless woman who is a nobody. Actually, it's worse. She's a known sinner. Everyone knows what sort of woman she is. And they keep their distance to maintain their own holiness or purity. Do you see this woman? Do you see the way they would have viewed her? Like the level of a dog? Someone unworthy to come into their home? To be in their presence? And so with that in mind, I want us to take a look at this story and think about the elements of the story and what the story is actually about. And I would suggest to you, first of all, this is a story that's about boldness. And there are a few stories like this within the Gospels. Uh, Another one is the woman with an issue of blood who she comes up and she touches the edge of Jesus' garment. You remember that story, right? And he gives a very similar utterance to her, that your faith has made you well. And there's a lot of misunderstanding about what Jesus is saying there in these situations where he does that. Uh, the, The modern religious world has taken that to some idea like you just believe in Jesus and everything takes care of itself. You don't have to do anything else. That is not at all the story of that woman or this woman in this story. In fact, these are stories of exceptional boldness. When we want to get our life right, when we realize that we are in sin, when we truly understand the magnitude of the sin that is in our life, we will understand that repentance really takes a lot of courage. 
It takes a lot of boldness to, to take the right steps, to do the right thing. Sometimes, and for some people like this woman, it may be extremely difficult. And I want to suggest to us that when we realize there's sin in our life, that we stop looking for the comfortable, low-impact answer to get out of it. What I mean is we wait, we're going to wait for the right moment. Like, we don't want everybody to know you know, we're going to wait a little while. We certainly don't want to tell the church, other people in the church about it, or anyone else. Like, we find the easiest way to deal with this so that we are not embarrassed. Now, I'm not suggesting we go out of our way to make it worse for ourselves. But what I do want us to understand is sometimes, and even often, true repentance takes a lot of boldness and courage like this woman. She knew that she wasn't wanted. She knew that she was a known sinner. She knew that walking into this house, a house that was going to not be welcoming of someone like her, could have been a very difficult situation. She could have been chewed out. She could have been blocked from coming in. Now, the Pharisees would do things like put food out and they would let needy people come in and, and eat. And so they, they had this idea because it is in the old law that you take care of people. But that is not the situation with this woman. She's a sinner and they keep away from sinners. They wouldn't even go into other Jewish people's homes sometimes because they were worried about their own holiness. And they certainly, if knowingly, wouldn't have let this woman come in. Somehow, I don't know how she gets by people or how she slips in. We aren't told all the details, but she gets into this house and she comes to Jesus' feet. And in stories like this, like the woman in Mark, she is going to do whatever it takes to get the answer that she needs. She doesn't care what people think. She doesn't care about Simon or the other judgmental Pharisees. Others around, often in a situation like this where you have some notable person coming in the house, and people would even surround the house to listen, right? So there's likely a lot of people here, and this woman's going to walk through all of this. And I can almost see the scene, right? I mean, we know who she is. She's a sinner. She has many sins. Everyone knows. And she's approaching the door, and everyone is not wanting to get too close, Because right, she's a little bit like that leper. If you touch her, you're unclean. And yet she walks up to Jesus and she begins to wipe his feet, to touch him. And you sort of understand the reaction of Simon then. When he looks at this and he sees this woman and the things that she's doing, and he, he utters this statement in his mind, if this man were really a prophet, like this is a test. And now I'm seeing if this guy was really from God, if he was really a prophet, he would know about this lady and what sort of woman she is and he would not let her touch him. He'd back away. He would remove himself from such a horrible sinner. And I suggest to you, this lady took a risk. She had heard some things about Jesus, no doubt. Maybe there's a level of confidence that she had based on some of the stories she had heard that Jesus would accept her. I'm sure word is spread. In fact, the text is telling us that the word is spreading about him and what he's doing. And so like the woman in Mark 5, maybe she feels this sort of confidence that she can come to Jesus and Jesus is different than these others. But even in the midst of that, you've got to think, how many times has she wanted to seek for repentance and forgiveness. How many times has she wanted to make this right and yet she knew if she tried to do this, she would get pushed away and rejected. And what was that moment like as she realizes where Jesus is, that she's going to make this walk and she's going to walk through this door. What did it take? What kind of courage did it take for her to take that step through that door and walk up to Jesus? These are the sort of details that in text we aren't often given. But I want to make the story alive for you. And you realize this is not just some made up fairy tale. This is not some nice story where there's a lady who did some things wrong and she walks into a house and talks to Jesus and then everything's better. That's not real life, is it? Maybe we haven't been in a situation just like this. But we can imagine the scenario of son that we know is a sinner. We know this person has done horrible things. And what are the reactions that people give in those moments? Have you ever been in a situation like that? 
You know, the person comes down to the front. Oh, here they come again. You know, what'd they do this time? I want us to see this as real. It's real in our lives too. The judgments that we sometimes make about people who are seeking forgiveness. And see how dangerous that is and how much courage it takes for someone like this woman to take these steps, to make this effort, to seek forgiveness, to want to change her life, to confess the things that she's doing wrong. All of this comes into this idea of boldness and courage that it took for this lady. But I also want you to see this is a story of blindness. We see the courage of the woman. That's a a pretty simple part of the story. But actually the message, what Jesus really wants to get to in this, aside from the important aspect of forgiving this woman of her sins, is to help Simon understand where he stands. Jesus loves Simon too. Simon just doesn't love Jesus quite as much at this point. He doesn't realize how desperately he needs Jesus. It's a story about how blind somebody like Simon can be and how self-righteousness fuels ingratitude and even keeps us from much-needed forgiveness. Now think back about that story earlier we looked at in chapter 5. Right? I want you to see how all these stories connect and the, the way in which they weave together a story that we should see as a whole, even as we're making our way to chapter 7, that Jesus has already encountered some of these people And in fact, it's really like everyone is coming together, right? Chapter 5 and verse 17, on one of those days, as he was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. This is chapter 5, verse 17. We went back a few chapters. Who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. They're coming from everywhere. There There are Pharisees and scribes, lawyers from all over the place that are coming to see Jesus. It's not just a few. They're all there. They're all coming to see him because they're hearing about him. Right? And then they start grumbling about the things he's doing. Remember? And that statement at the end, right? I've come for those who need a physician. Like, I came to heal the sinners, not those who are righteous. And of course, there's irony in that statement. It's an irony that we're pulling out in chapter 7 that Simon imagines himself to be righteous. So righteous that he doesn't really need Jesus. That's where all of these Pharisees stand, at least in chapter 5 and 7, where Jesus is speaking to them. They are so blind, just like in John 9 with the blind man. And the Pharisees are there asking Jesus, hey, are we blind too? Right? They, they sort of got it. They're not accepting him. And what Jesus is saying is, when you don't accept me, you're blind to your condition. And Simon, despite his elevated status, despite, despite the fact that he's a ruler, and he should understand the will of God, and he should be seeing what God is doing through the Messiah, he refuses to see. He doesn't see the need that he has. In fact, he's so focused on the condition of this woman that he is missing the fact that the Christ is sitting here with him. Self-righteousness stifles growth. It keeps us from being what we ought to be. In Simon's house, no one grows. Because in Simon's house, no one can admit sin. In Simon's house, everyone pretends that everything is okay and that all is well. In Simon, the Pharisee's house, image matters most, right? Everyone needs to know that others are holy here and we don't let unholy things come in here. That's what Simon's house is like. That's why it's so offensive to them when this woman who is a sinner comes in. Think about it. A sinner is coming to Jesus. Think about that language. Isn't that what we want? Isn't that what we call for all the time? We want sinners to come to Jesus. And my concern is that sometimes and in some places, image is really important. And pretending that we don't make mistakes and that we're not sinful is really important. And not admitting sins to one another is really important. That seems sometimes to be the focus of some places so much so that those who realize they're in sin and need help are ashamed to get help. This woman is bold. She knows she's going to be rejected by these self-righteous Pharisees. And yet she still comes to Jesus. I think David De Silva 
makes a couple statements that are really good about this. He's a, a New Testament scholar, uh, does really good writing. But he, he makes this statement about the nature of, of churches. He says, the church that takes Luke's word to heart will be a community of mercy and love, actively seeking the restoration of fallen people. The sort of community that can become a place for the healing of the broken. One of the obstacles to achieving this end is our tendency within the church to mask our own fallenness, to put on our best face. We act like Simon the Pharisee. That story urges, urges us to, encourages us to face the sins that weigh us down, to own them so that we can be released from them. I, I know sometimes our reactions are just kind of like the common way that we interact. So we don't always need to make too much of them. But I think you know the feeling where we come in and we say, how are you doing? And we just say, we're fine. You know, like we couldn't pay our bills this week and we just had a huge fight with our spouse and our kids are angry at us. And all these terrible things happened today, but someone asked how we're doing. Oh, I'm fine, I'm fine. That's the sort of thing that De Silva's talking about here. And I get it. Sometimes we don't want to talk about stuff. We're not at that place yet. So I'm not saying we can't ever say that. So don't misunderstand me. But I have really tried really hard. When I talk to people at church, and, and I want to emphasize, especially at a place like this, when we're with our people, when we're with our brethren, we've got to be honest. It doesn't mean we need to give every detail and tell every part of a fight or every struggle with our kids. I'm not saying we've got to do all that. But you know, when someone says, hey, how's it going today? And it's not been the best day, you say, yeah, it hasn't been the best today. And then you can go as far down that road as you need to go. But we can kind of take the mask off a little bit and be honest with each other and get to a place where there are some that we can even confess some of the struggles and, and the weaknesses that we're having. And I so appreciate the elders' reaction last night to the topic we discussed being so open to the congregation and the, the reality that you can come to them. That is powerful stuff. Realizing we all struggle at times and we need help. And I'll tell you what, preachers and preachers' wives were there too. We are no different. We struggle too. Sometimes we're down. Sometimes we have a bad day. And just because we spend our time reading scripture and studying and preaching sermons and teaching classes doesn't mean we don't have struggles. It's just part of life. And it's why we need each other so badly. We need the encouragement. We, we don't need all the judgment, the assumptions, but we do need to lift each other up and to encourage and to tell things the way they are. When we are struggling, when we're doing something wrong, we need to be told it's wrong. Right? And, and Jesus doesn't try to avoid that. He doesn't say, oh, her sins aren't that bad. You know, she hasn't done all that much. It's not the direction Jesus goes. But what he does do is he offers love and acceptance and compassion. And he has an answer for her many sins. He gives her hope. I just, I can't even imagine how many times she wondered if there was any hope for her. And for whatever reason, at that moment, she was courageous enough to come to the feet of Jesus and wipe his feet and to shed tears and to show her remorse and allow Jesus to change her life. De Silva goes on to say, we need to respond to vulnerability as Jesus did rather than as Simon did. The community cannot respond to someone who had worked through serious hurt or vulnerability or temptation by suggesting that such activity is out of place among respectable people. I don't know all that much about this group. I know little bits that Chris have told me. It's always been positive. And I've seen some amazing things here. And so I certainly can't make any judgments about the things that, that take place here. But I have seen in places I've been before where the admission of sin is sort of taken as like now you're sort of a second-class citizen in the kingdom, right? We all recognize the problems you have, right? And we'll give you a hug and say, we're sorry. But then it doesn't go much further than that sometimes. We're a little standoffish. You know, they got a drinking problem or they have some other issue and we, we kind of want to keep our distance from that. Let me just suggest that is not the right response. That if we love those people, we will take them in, we will hug them, 
We will tell them how much we care about them. Self-righteous attitudes sound a little bit like this. If you really wanted to serve God, you wouldn't have gotten this mess. Or figure out your problems, and then you're welcome to come here. Or maybe this one. Have you ever heard this? People like that make the church look bad. I've heard that one. I'm not sure we want those kinds of people, right? That's what Simon's thinking, if he knew what sort of woman. But I'll tell you what these gospel stories tell us. It is this sort of woman who comes to Jesus. She realizes the state of her sinfulness and how desperately she needs Jesus. She is under no persuasion that she's got it figured out and she's going to be okay and she can just do things her own way and it's all going to be all right. She's not deceived into thinking that. She knows that he is the answer and she doesn't care what obstacles are in her way. She's going to get to him because he can solve her problem. That is the sort of person that Jesus wants. And that's why when she comes in, he is so eager to show interest in her. He doesn't shoo her away or remove himself in disgust, which is the reaction of Simon and the others. No, Jesus knows exactly what sort of woman this is. This is a woman who's seeking forgiveness in her life, who's going to confess the things that she's done. She wants to repent and she wants to change. And she's looking desperately for someone to help her with this. And up until this point in her life, she hasn't found a single person. Even amongst all those rulers and scribes, and lawyers, and people who know the law so well. There's not a single one that she thinks can help her. But when Jesus comes in, she goes to him. I, I don't know the mentality that you have. There's so many different people in this room tonight, and all the various things that maybe we have done wrong as a group. But I do know that sometimes we feel very unworthy. We talked about that a little bit last night. And maybe this is something that this guilt bothers you, that you're just not the sort of person that God would love and that God would save or that Jesus would care about. This story is about you. He knows what sort of person you are. And if you feel that guilt and if you know you need him, He wants to forgive you. He wants you to come to him with repentance and confession. He wants to help you change your life. He knows exactly what sort of person you are. He knows exactly what sort of person I am. And that's why he wants you to come to him so badly. You are not unworthy to accept God's grace. You're not unworthy to walk the plan of God for your salvation and for your oneness with him. No one is in that condition. It doesn't matter what you've done. God knows you and he wants you. He wants you to desperately come back to him and admit how badly you need him. And it's exactly that sort of person. So if you feel that way, you are the kind of person he wants. Because you realize how badly you need Jesus. And that you are not the answer in and of yourself. And if we don't feel that way, that's kind of scary. Isn't that the point of the story? He tells Simon. I hope Simon got the the point quickly and realized in the moment how desperately he needed Jesus. Don't know if that happened. But in this moment, it's what sort of person Simon is that's scary. Not this sinful, sincere woman. So the warning for us is that we are not like Simon. that we ignore our own sins and we look down with disdain on others. We are condescending to other people around us and pointing out their mistakes and the things they struggle with while at the same time ignoring our own desperate need. I want to take you away from the Gospels for just a moment to 1 John. 1 John chapter 1, this is a great text that really speaks about this idea of our connection to God. 1 John chapter 1 in verse 5, 1 John 1 and verse 5, it says, This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. 
But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Now, chapter 2 that follows is equally as powerful. I want to come back to that in just a moment. But I want to point out some things from this text that are relevant to this story with Simon the Pharisee. The problem here in this message is that God is light. And if we claim to have fellowship with him and we walk in darkness, that makes me a liar. Simon is a liar. He claims to be righteous, to be whole. He is this Pharisee that proclaims his own holiness and righteousness, but he doesn't understand the will of God. He has rejected the purpose of God for himself, it says earlier in the Gospel of Luke. That's what the Pharisees and the scribes are doing. He claims this connection with God, and this is scary stuff. God is light. Simon is living in darkness, and that makes him a liar because he says he's right with God according to his own self-righteousness. But notice where the text goes next. It says, if we confess our sins, verse 9, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us. The clean one in this story is the sinful woman at this point. She is coming, admitting her wrongdoing. She is wanting to repent. She wants to change her life. She is the one who is cleansed. Your sins are forgiven. Go in peace, he tells her. And Simon is the one living in impurity. He's the one living a lie. John goes on to say, my little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. Right? He, he wants us to understand that the answer to this is confession. When we admit the problems that we have, that's when we stop sinning. Right? We admit the fact that we have failures and weaknesses, and then we come and we confess those and we say, hey, I'm not doing this right. I need help. I need to change. That's when we stop. We don't stop when we hold it in and pretend like we don't have sins. And we pretend like we're holy when we have problems. And we pretend all of this to uphold some image. That's not when we stop sinning. That's when we keep on sinning. And it doesn't stop. Because we fail to take care of the problem. But then there's this powerful statement after that. Man, this is a hard one sometimes for us to accept. But if anyone does sin... We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. His story just gets better and better. Man, there's an answer for this. We can confess our sins. We can admit our wrongdoings. And he'll cleanse us. And we'll have fellowship with him. And we can start working on not sinning anymore. But what if we sin again? Well, we have an advocate. Now, John's not saying go and continue in sin. That's... That's not the point, just as Paul was not saying that. But what he's saying is, is that God loves us. And there is grace and there is mercy. And the answer here is just to admit that we need help. To admit that, that God is the answer for us, that we aren't perfect, that we have sinned, that we struggle with sin, that we are weak, that we need to admit that we need to get help so that we can no longer sin. And then if we do sin, we still have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, if we are in Christ. But Simon the Pharisee and his friends reject that. They don't really feel like they need Jesus. They needed to understand that Jesus is the answer. It's a story of blessing, a story of acceptance and hope. I want you to understand that if Jesus can see this sinful woman, someone who everyone knew she was a sinner and she had many sins, Jesus sees me and he sees you. And just like this woman, you may have reservations. It's scary. It's hard to come admit that you've done something wrong, to admit to your spouse or admit to a friend or admit to the congregation or to the elders. But that's, that's not something that's fun. But God tells us, through James especially, that that's the answer. We need to confess. We need to get things back on track. We need to admit the wrongs on our life. And then from there, we can find justification and peace. 
And I just love how different Jesus is in this story. Yeah, this woman, she comes in and he doesn't move. You notice he just sits there. He lets her take her hair down and cry and wipe his feet. All the things that Simon really should have done for him, he didn't do. And this woman begins to do some of these. Simon, like I said, he doesn't really seem to need Jesus all that much. Doesn't so much hospitality to him. Doesn't make sure he's taken care of. But this poor, sinful woman, she's the one who leaves rich and blessed and honored because she loves much. So I just want to ask you, do you see yourself? Which one are you? Are you the sinful woman? How many times have you doubted that God would forgive somebody like you? How many times have you gone other places, right? Sought pleasures or self-help gurus or some other thing to try to fix whatever the problem is and it doesn't work. Jesus knows what sort of person you are. He knows all your sins and he loves you anyway. And he's the answer. He's waiting for you to come to him. And there might be some self-righteous Simons out there who want to get in your way and be obstacles and tell you you're not worthy and you haven't done it right. But be like that woman. Just ignore them. And come and follow the feet of Jesus. And the real scary thing is, am I the self-righteous Simon the Pharisee? I think that's really the more dangerous position here. If you're full of guilt, I mean, you know, you know what you need to do. But if you feel like this sermon doesn't apply to you, and like this story doesn't really mean a whole lot, and you're doing pretty good and everything's fine, I don't know, we may need to take a hard look at whether or not we're like Simon the Pharisee and are blind to the reality of our situation. Am I really aware enough to realize my own desperate situation and need for Jesus. And Jesus loved Simon. He loved all these Pharisees. And he got to a point where he was pretty rough with them and he condemned them and he called them hypocrites and, and did all that. And, and it seems so harsh. We talked about love already earlier in the week, but Jesus loved them. He was trying to convince them how they needed him and he was the answer and they weren't listening and, and he got to a point where he had to be just blatant and straightforward with them and tell them like it was. But he wasn't doing that to be ugly or mean. He was doing it because he wanted them to see their need for him. And, and that's my point tonight. It, it, I'm not trying to be ugly or mean, but if you're looking down on other people and you're judging others and that's what you do, you desperately need Jesus. And we want to help you do that tonight. You can give your life to him. You can give up yourself, your own self-righteousness, your own vision of what makes you good and holy and right and begin to rework that through the vision of Jesus Christ and being recreated after his image. And that's what truly matters. Can we help you do that? Why don't you come now as we stand and we sing together?